Now, I'm a firm believer that everyone is entitled to the comeback they're willing to earn. But when my producers asked me to sit down with a former skinhead, I had to really question the authenticity of that kind of comeback. Christian Picciolini spent eight years preaching hate and violence in my hometown of Chicago. He left the neo-Nazi movement more than 20 years ago, but has he really changed his ways? A warning that some of our viewers might find this interview triggering. Hi, Erica. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. So I want to be very clear to myself, to my family, and to our viewers why I'm here today. I'm here because I think that it's very important to um, acknowledge our past and put historical context into what's going on today. And I also think it's important that you are making an attempt and succeeding in changing people's hearts and minds. So that's why I'm sitting here today. So I wanna ask you why you're sitting here today. Acknowledging our past is, uh, is the first step in moving forward. And for me, for the last 20 years, it really has been about trying to repair the harm that I've caused during that time. So take us back to 14-year-old Christian. How did you get involved with neo-Nazism? It was 1987. Uh, I was 14 years old and I was standing in an alley smoking a joint and a man who was almost twice my age came up to me and he pulled the joint from my mouth and he looked me in the eyes and I'll never forget this. He said, that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile. I didn't know what a communist, a Jew, or even what the word docile meant at 14, but it was, it seemed like it was the first time that anybody saw me. And having hit what I call potholes in life, those kind of traumas that we all experience in life and some of us navigate them and some of us cannot, those potholes detoured me to the fringes where that narrative was prevalent. How do you go from being a vulnerable recruit to actually leading the pack? Well, I kind of went from nothing to somebody almost overnight. And by that time, I was so afraid of going back to the nothingness that I had before that, uh, that I was willing to do anything to maintain that, that feeling of respect, which of course wasn't true respect, it was fear. You created a rock band um, based on white supremacy. Yeah. What is the reason behind music spreading the message? You have to remember this was the 80s and early 90s too. We didn't have the internet. Music was our social network. It was a way to uh, educate people into uh, our ideology, to project the hatred that we had towards other people. So it was a very, very powerful tool. I opened a record store in 1994, uh, primarily to sell this racist music that I was making and importing. Uh, but I also knew that I couldn't get a business license uh, or sustain a business without selling all sorts of music. So I decided to stock a little corner with hip hop and punk rock music and heavy metal. And um, I didn't think anybody would ever come in to buy it. Uh, but I was very surprised when people of color, when gay people, when Jewish people came in uh, to shop there. Uh, specifically, there was one black teenager who came in a lot. One day he came in and he was not very happy. He was not joking around. He was kind of sad. And uh, I had asked him what was wrong. And uh, I remember him telling me that his mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer uh, that day. And suddenly I had a connection with him because my mother, uh, just a few months before then, had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And suddenly there was a connection that I didn't know could exist. So you did mention that the music is still available online today. People can get this, um, including Dylan Roof, who was responsible for killing nine people um, in Emanuel Church. Even though your ideology has changed, how do you prevent people at this point from becoming a Dylan Roof? And what does it feel like to you when you hear the story of Emanuel Nine? It crushed me. When I found out that Dylan Roof four months before he walked into Mother Emanuel had uh, heard my song and had posted on a white supremacist forum uh, the lyrics to my music, it crushed me again knowing that the words that I put out almost 30 years ago, despite my efforts to try and have it removed, were still reaching people. There's a lot of pressure in media to make sure that I'm not affording a platform to someone who's going to be able to misuse it. 
is there, do you feel like there is a way that you'll ever atone for everything that you've done? I don't think so. I don't know that I ever can atone for what I've done. I put things out into the world that are still there today. I spread ideas. I recruited people whose lives changed because of this. There were victims whose lives changed because of what I did. Uh, and all I can do is try and repair the damage that I've done actively. Uh, I don't think that I'll ever get to the point, nor do I deserve to ever be absolved for what I did. Uh, because I think we have to be accountable for our actions, otherwise it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Like I said, it's so important for people to have conversations. Historical context is everything. So for you to be vocal, to speak out on what, where are the genesis of where this all comes from, I think is very important and I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And I think we can do this while still holding people accountable. Nobody should escape uh, their bad actions or how they've hurt other people, but there is a path forward for some. When we come back, Christian joins our panel to reveal how the white nationalism movement has evolved since his membership and why we should all be concerned. Stay with us. We just shared the story of Christian Picciolini, a former neo-Nazi leader who has been actively removing people from hate groups for more than 20 years. Earlier, Sam Torrey and I sat down with Christian to learn how the white nationalist movement has changed and why the fight to end this kind of hate is far from over. A warning that some of our viewers might find this interview triggering. Christian, thank you for joining us today and for sharing your story. Now, last year, for the first time ever, the Department of Homeland Security added white supremacist violence to its list of priority threats in the U.S. In fact, they say it's their highest threat and that it is on the rise. So given that a lot of people still believe that white nationalism is fake news, what would you say to those people? And do you believe that the current administration is affecting its growth? Well, I would say absolutely that hate is not a hoax. Uh, groups like the Anti-Defamation League have just reported that there were over 2,100 hate crimes uh, last year. Uh, there were over 2,100 uh, incidents of posting flyers, uh, especially in places like college campuses where 25% of those uh, flyering incidents occurred. Uh, attacks from white supremacists are on the rise. Uh, in fact, there have been more attacks since 9-11 by white supremacists on American soil than by any other foreign or domestic terrorist group on American soil. This is absolutely a problem, and the fact that we are now starting to make it a priority is important. Uh, but the problem is, is we don't have domestic terrorism laws right now to prosecute these. The best that we could do is a hate crime. Uh, and in some states, there aren't hate crime laws. Uh, so until we can start to identify groups that are tied to terror organizations overseas, which they are, this is a transnational problem. Um, I don't know that we'll be effective in applying laws to them. Wow. Christian, hi. I am going to be super honest because I'm always honest. I'm like a little uncomfortable and nervous yeah. and I just want to tell you that and I yeah. just want to say thank you for being here. Um, sorry. Thank you. This is, as, this is as real yeah. as it gets, you know, and this is a real conversation. So thank you for being here. You did a Nazi salute outside of a concentration camp, and there's a picture taken. Yeah. And I want to know if you knew what that meant at that time, and how do you feel about you then? Yeah. And again, I can't reemphasize how thankful I am to have a conversation with you. No, Especially being Jewish. Yeah, as the only Jewish person on this panel, it's, um, I just want to be real, it's uncomfortable, but I'm so glad I got the chance to speak with you. Well, I'm so glad that you asked that question and, and thank you for being honest with me. This is uncomfortable. Right. Um, I took that picture almost 28 years ago uh, in front of the Dachau concentration camp. Um, and I th you know, looking back at that photo now, I realize how scared I was even then doing that and how confused I was at mm. that time, but how committed I was uh, at the same time to you know, go through with promoting hate and even being violent myself. Uh, it's hard for me to look at that person because I don't recognize that mm -hmm. person. Uh, but I also know that, you know, for that eight years that I was involved, from the time I was 14 until I was 23, I don't know that I was myself mm -hmm. because I really was trying to be something that I wasn't. Um, and, you know, people say, well, maybe, you know, people can't change. And I say, well, maybe I didn't. I kind of went back to that person I was before I was 14 years old. Mm. Uh, and then for eight years, I really was off track. Well, thank you. I'll give you a handshake. Oh. Thanks again. Thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.
So, Christian, you've been um, very informative about the new wave and how it's been an effort to temper, blend in, um, it's more covert versus overt. So what is the new culture of skinheads as someone who used to be on the inside? Yeah, I mean, I think we recognized, Erica, back in the 80s and early 90s that being a skinhead or being very visible was working against us. At first we were very small and part of our MO was to terrify people with the way we looked, the symbols we wore. Uh, and then there was this move from boots to suits. Wow. Where, you know, they started to, once I, after I had left, they started to recognize that law enforcement was doing a very good job of infiltrating, of mm. putting pressure on them because they were visible. So they decided to blend in. They decided they needed to speak like the people they wanted to recruit and that meant toning down their language while still ha having the same message. David Duke was one of the first people to really kind of abandon that look. He got rid of his Klan robe and the Klan hood. He ran for office, was elected to the House of Representatives in Louisiana, uh, and the rest is kind of history. That's when we saw this transition to you know the mainstream of white nationalism. Although those laws, we've always had white supremacist laws in our country. We've always done that, but what's happening now is a lot of the words coming from the administration, coming from politicians, are starting to really embolden them. They feel like they have somebody that they can trust in power. Wow. Jeez, Erica always says that you're more fearful of the covert rather than the overt. And that's right. exact. this rebranding movement sounds exactly like that, which uh, makes me really uncomfortable. This is happening in this country. You heard it here from Christian and I'm glad we're talking about it because if we can talk about it, we can identify it and then we can solve it, right? So thank you for being here. And uh, to our DBL Nation, Christian's third book, Breaking Hate, Confronting the New Culture of Extremism is in bookstores tomorrow. Again, um, I appreciate your advocacy. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. I am here with Christian, who is so brave to be here. He, his uh, third book, Breaking Hate, is coming out, and he advocates for uh, bringing people together instead of uh, divisiveness and racism and anti-Semitism. Uh, we wanted to get back really quickly to the Boots to Suits comment you made. I see Charlottesville, for instance, and our viewers see it live when we were live, and we see not Ku Klux Klan hoods, but white polos and khakis, right? And I'm saying, is that as dangerous as a Ku Klux Klan or a Nazi, those guys? Yeah, I think it's more dangerous, actually, because it's invisible. Right. It's our neighbors, it's our children, it's our cheerleaders, even. It's, it's the people we wouldn't have our defenses up against. Right, you're safe, yeah. you feel, almost. Yeah, you're safe, and plus they blend in, so it's much easier for them to recruit because, you know, being a skinhead with tattoos all over, it's kind of off-putting, but yeah. if you look just like the people you're trying to recruit, then there's a little, it's, it's easier for them to do that. But that does not mean that they're not dangerous. Right. These people have, you know, just over, since Charlottesville, you know, a dozen people have died. And we're talking not about the, the shootings in the synagogues or the mosques, which then would bring the number into the 200s. Wow. So these are people that are very, very dangerous, and we need to be very careful. Uh, tell me more about where parents, because our audience, there's a lot of grandparents, there's a lot of parents out there. Video game chats? Yeah. Do do you want to just talk to your kids about that? Because I know you can literally speak to people. Almost. Yeah, and that's the problem is they're literally being recruited. Like on a headsets. earphone, yeah. Yeah, and the way the way it starts out is they'll just be in a regular game. You know, let's say it's you know Call of Duty or Minecraft or whatever game it is, and they're playing with a group of people, and the recruiter will drop the N word, and they'll gauge how people respond. If wow. some people you know push back, it's a bait. Yeah, it's a bait, and there inevitably will be you know those couple of kids that laugh nervously or maybe laugh because they're racist or whatever. But that's that one them, kid. That's right. And then you pull them to another room and it just kind of goes down a, you know, a rabbit hole that way. You know, it's not, I wouldn't say it's the new stranger danger, but we need to teach our mm -hmm. kids to be better critical thinkers, mm -hmm. to not be duped by manipulators mm -hmm. who are trying to prey on them. Mm -hmm. And we need to really empower them as they're younger before they get to that position. That's very interesting. Lastly, I want to ask you, when you write the book and you speak about advocacy, do you feel sorry every day? Do you feel guilty every day? Yeah. Or do you kind of move into a new person? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think it's always going to be Sorry for being personal, but yeah. No, it, it, it's important because it, I do believe we have to be accountable for our actions. This is 30 years after I've left. Right. And I'm still holding myself accountable. I think it's the self-reflection, the, the guilt, and 
all of those things that remind me of who I used to be are what make me who I am today. It's what pushes me forward today. Wow. Well, please write us in if you have questions, and we will try and get back to Christian and keep in touch with him. Again, Breaking Hate is his third book. I can't tell you what it's like to speak to you because as a Jew, it's really incredible to have a conversation with someone that has changed. It's very weird, but I'm very thankful we're, in a weird way. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're in a moment right now where I think so many things are, are starting to seem like they did in 1930. Yes. Where, you know, good people are starting to kind of flounder on what they should do. And I, uh, what I'll tell people is we have to be vigilant and cannot afford to be ambivalent right now. This is not an epidemic, but it's something that we definitely need to pay attention to. Thanks again. Great job. Thanks, Thanks again. Thank I you guess. so much. Absolutely. Absolutely.